I would like to introduce our panelists for this session. I would also request the speakers on the panel to kindly come up on the stage. We have Mr. Amit Malik, who's the Managing Director, Public Sector, Cisco, India. I would request you to please put your hands together for our panelists. We also have Mr. Sunil Dube, who's the advisor, Urban Innovation and Smart Cities, University of Sydney. We have Mr. Jung Wu Lee, who's the managing director of Seoul Digital Foundation. We have Mr. NSN Murthy, Partner and leader, Smart Cities, PricewaterhouseCoopers. We have Mr. Karthikeyan Natrajan, Global Head, Engineering, IoT and Enterprise Mobility, Tech Mahindra. The session would be moderated by Mr. Sanjay Jaju, Department of Defense Production. He's the Joint Secretary for the Department of Defense Production, Government of India. So can we once again hear it for all these gentlemen up here on the stage? I would now like to hand over to Mr. Jaju. Okay. Very good afternoon, friends. Uh, I can see a lot of people coming in. Postman sessions are always very difficult to manage. And uh, I have a very distinguished panel like this one. Uh, friends, I have worked in cities. I have, I have, I have worked in two, two cities in Hyderabad and Vishakhapatnam as what you call as municipal commissioner or a city manager and uh, one thing that always you know used to amuse me was the fact that you know cities have outlived any other discovery or invention that we had uh, in our human history and you had inventions which have outlived themselves uh, you have people whom we don't even remember today but there are cities which are uh, right from the industrial civilization days till now, you have cities which have grown, cities which have, uh, you know, created a complete culture of people uh, reacting with each other, talking to each other, networking with each other. And you know, uh, one can say that cities have been at as a fountainhead of our civilizational growth. And uh, when I, when I talk of cities, you know, don't confuse me with metropolises I and mean, cities to me are uh, any habitation where uh, you have a uh, lot of people flocking together and living together, that to me is a concept of a city. And, uh, but in the way we understand a city, you know, if you look at 1800, say 200 years back, we had uh, Practically two to three percent of our population living in cities, and if you look at it now, we have more than fifty percent of our people who are actually living in cities. And as I understand, more than two hundred thousand people are coming to what you call as call them as cities every day. So apparently, in the next couple of years or couple of decades, this this number is definitely going to go up. Now, uh, the question is, would it be possible for us to provide to our citizens 
आपको सस्टेनेबल हेल्दी लाइफ हेल्दी लिविंग इन अ सिटी विथ सिस्टम्स यू नो विच आर लेट्स से इन ट्वेंटी फर्स्ट सेंचुरी सिटी लिव विथ द सिस्टम्स दर आर एटीन सेंचुरी I would say that the answer is quite clear that it's absolutely impossible. So, how are we going to integrate the systems and technologies so that we can manage our cities more efficiently? I think that is what is the theme that's going to drive this particular session. And uh, I have uh, five speakers, and what I'll do is. come down to mr amit malik first so that we find here yeah. and uh, amit malik is the managing director of for public sector in cisco and uh, he is going to be talking about digital transformation of governments and when it comes to digital transformation of governments i can i can give you a small anecdote when i was municipal commissioner in vishakhapatnam uh that is about 18 years back in 2000 year 2000 can you imagine what we used to do with our street lights i mean for every ward every lane i used to have an operator every day evening he used to go and switch on the street lights every day morning he will again go back switch off the street lights and as municipal commissioner when we were in our rounds the biggest challenge was to ensure that in the morning round we don't find the street lights on and when you go for your evening round you still have the street lights on so that is what the situation was so those were the systems and the technologies so very happy that the life has actually moved on by you have been talking in terms of technologies systems sensors which can integrate uh, not just humans but can integrate machines your sensors and machines which are becoming uh, intelligent machines have started to learn from the history and uh, the data sets are becoming much bigger and wider and i think cisco has been playing a huge role in that and and no other than mr amit malik will tell us how uh, how this is done although they are giving us 12 minutes but i will request you you know confine your presentation to 10 minutes so that we can create more interactions in the subsequent uh, uh, round of this particular panel Mr. Malik, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Jaju, uh, my fellow panelists, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this session. I'll try and keep you as awake as possible. I know post lunch it becomes a little bit of a difficulty, but I'll try and keep you as awake as possible. You did mention uh, a word. He said nobody better than me, so I don't know whether that's true or not. But at least I'll try and make it your time well spent. But before I start, I was supposed to speak on digital transformation. Honestly, that's a real broad word. Digital transformation is practically all-encompassing. So before I was to talk on digital transformation, I thought let me just take a step back and really analyze the world we are living in today. Honestly, we are living we are living in the most interesting of times, the most challenging of times. we are seeing reality and fiction the gap between it getting very very blurred why do i say that i mean the other day i was having a talk with my daughter and we were talking about the times we've grown up watching serials like star trek all the science fiction i mean i never thought in my lifetime i would actually see flying cars i would see drones i would see all the variables that we are seeing and lifetime is also probably huge probably about 5 years ago if people told me a few things i wouldn't have believed them coming from a technology background i would not have believed that it is going to happen so soon even 2 years ago if somebody said in india we're going to have be discussing about a drone policy 2 years from now i would have said probably it'll take 10 years and this is coming from somebody who's working day in day out in technology the point is the world is moving very very fast and today it is if we talk about transformation and specifically around governments it is about multiple things it is not about just building highways and roads it is also about building internet highways it is also about building a virtual world which is going to be very very significant going forward so while fiction and reality 
boundaries are getting blurred, so are the boundaries between virtual and physical. There's another boundary which is getting blurred, which is what I, I, I really like what the Vice President said in the morning, reform to transform. In fact, reform and transform boundaries are also getting blurred. Because today to reform, you really need to transform. Anyway, I also uh, actually love the definition and because this resonates very well with us. So if somebody asks me, how do you define digital transformation for governments? I would definitely say transformation, especially digital transformation is something which improves livability. Very simply said. But obviously it has many elements on what improves livability. Livability is improves if there is sustainable economic growth. We've heard a lot of people talk about what is sustenance and what is sustainable economic growth. And a lot of consultants have done this analysis across the globe, which talk about how digital transformation has a direct impact on GDP. At least a 1 to 3% of GDP growth is directly related to digital transformation. Cybersecurity is something which is becoming so critical now, which is not something which we talked about a decade ago. Today, your livability is dependent on cybersecurity. Just imagine, and we've heard so many such instances, where if your banks get compromised, if your accounts get compromised, I'm sure even if you live in the best of the world and you realize that somebody's taken away money from your bank, that's not a definition of livability. That's something which is going to hurt you real bad. And honestly, today it is not just banks getting compromised, cities are getting compromised. Now that's the other part of the digital transformation. While on one hand, we get everything connected, the other hand, we live with these challenges of technology, which is security threats. The landscape is increasing so much that one needs to be very, very aware that every city, every infrastructure, every digital transformation is on the foundation of security, which is very, very critical. And obviously, thanks to transformation, the employability, employability question should go up. People should be more safe. Environment should, should be better. But how do I define this change? And very often people, you know, mistake when we talk about digital transformation. They assume that people just want to adopt technology for the sake of technology, which is definitely not so. And I'm very, very clear. Technology is probably a great slave to have it's a very dangerous master. We definitely don't want a, a, a position where technology becomes a master and we start adopting technology for the sake of technology. In short, digital transformation is good if it enables new citizen engagement, improves the way citizens engage with the government, transforms the way the governments work. Great example here in Rajasthan, I've seen some of the ATMs they've created, eMitra, fantastic example of transformation, how the process have been transformed. Today, you can go up to an ATM machine to get your birth certificate. I mean, this is transformation. There are not many countries who can say that they have a solution like that, and this is happening right here in Rajasthan. This is fantastic. This is changing lives. Empowering workforce, creating innovation. Now, I'm also convinced that if we have to move forward, or any country has to move forward, Today, innovation is the key. What really are the areas of digital transformation? The first, obviously, is when we say digital government, we want everything connected. And the way things are getting connected, IoT, you've heard the term used multiple times. You've heard multiple numbers thrown at you, how many devices are going to be connected on the internet. Because the internet of yesteryears was about people, getting people together. Now it is about people and devices. Mr. Jaju just mentioned about how machines are getting connected. Machines talking to people, people talking to people, machines talking to machines. That is transformation. The other pillar is smart cities, where I would not really confine it to smart cities. I think it's time to change the narrative to a smart nation. Because there are so many elements, and one really needs to have a blueprint of a smart nation which is all encompassing, which talks about education, healthcare, skill development. Can technology today answer some of these areas? The answer is an absolute yes. In rural areas today, you can go ahead and build schools, but you can't build teachers. 
you can't build doctors. Those problems remain. Can technology help? Yes. Today, virtually, you can have a teacher sitting out of, say, Jaipur and taking on the villages in Rajasthan and giving them quality education. If you don't do that, what is the disaster today? And why do we have so many problems? A teacher who is probably in the rural area, who is not as qualified, will go on teaching wrong things and the kids grow up learning that. For example, if your teacher has taught you APP, LE is Apple, you will continue to believe it's Apple and not Apple. But if the teacher himself doesn't know and there's another teacher who can do assisted teaching from the central place, from a better city, now that's transformation. And obviously, we need to ensure that the safety and security of individuals changes. And technology can play a big role. Today, a streetlight can be a source of public safety. How's that? Today, smart streetlights have cameras inbuilt. So they can also give you surveillance. Not only that, today you can have feature, but for example, you can have an alarm button on your mobile and if there is a lady who's walking on a deserted street and there is an issue, there is somebody attacks her or whatever, she just presses the panic button, all the street lights will start flickering for a couple of hundred meters if you want. Now that becomes a big deterrent and automatically messages go to the right people, the police, etc. that there is a lady in distress. Now that's transformation. Cybersecurity I've already touched on and I see uh, in the interest of time I'll move on a little bit faster. So what's really the pillars for building a smart government or a digital government? I would say these are the few pillars which are very critical for building a smart infrastructure. First is, I mean come what may, we have to move into a multi-cloud environment. There is no two ways about it that one will have to jump this bandwagon and already the states and the governments in the country are also working in that direction. Secondly is really focus and reinvent your entire network. Because if you are going to run services, you have to ensure that your network is capable. It's like saying, I'll build a kacha road, but I want the best of vehicles to ply on that. That's not going to be possible. You'll have to have really great roads if you want to have the best vehicles to ply on that and giving the same level of, the great level of comfort as well. So we'll have to reinvent the way we design networks. Power of data. Somebody said data is the new oil, which is actually true. Today, data can be used for so many things because thanks to all these sensors, etc., there's going to be data everywhere. And the government would probably be in the best position to analyze this data to understand what really ails the citizen. Simple example, if you have environmental sensors and you're able to detect in certain areas, there is a very high uh, pollution happening. This can be directly correlated to traffic at that time, which gives you a very clear idea that during these times, if I were to have an alternate way of moving the traffic, probably I will not have that kind of a pollution. Very simple, basic example, but you can keep on thinking multiple things around this. Security obviously is foundational. At end of the day, you should be creating meaningful experiences. Else, I think the whole idea is lost. Yeah. Great example of a smart nation is Singapore. I think uh, they're really building a complete blueprint of how the nation needs to evolve. And which is obviously on the backbone of a very, very fast network. Because unless this pipe is resilient enough, you will not be able to build the smart nation that you want. And I'll move a little fast again, but uh, coming closer to home, so it is not that the innovation is only happening in the West or is happening in countries like Singapore. There's a lot, there's a lot happening in this country as well. The national broadband network, which the government has envisaged, which is going to connect all the rural areas, which is already getting connected, rural Wi-Fi is already on. Great innovation in Rajasthan around education, around e -Sanchar. I'm not going to get into this. But quickly give you one example on uh, a, a very interesting thing which I heard thanks to the rural Wi-Fi. I was told in villages to get a caste certificate. I mean, it's a big problem. People need to come and invest a lot of time and money coming to the city to get a caste certificate. Today, thanks to the rural Wi-Fi and CSCs, they are able to digitally access uh, the portals where they can download caste certificate in minutes, which is probably transformation. Amit, I will just move on to summarize, um, because I'm 
end of the time. So basically what I said, digital transformation needs to impact everything from education to healthcare, definitely provides stimulus to economy. And end of the day, digital transformation is something which is, it's non-negotiable. There is no way that one can think that probably digital transformation can be avoided. It is not an option. It is a must for all governments, enterprises. Yeah. With that, uh, thank you so much. I think I have exceeded my time. Thank you so much. Thanks, Amit. In fact, uh, uh, I was just thinking that, you know, why, how the cities, uh, wherever you see them, have continued to remain vibrant. I think the primary reason for that has been that they've been involved in. And, uh, you know, this evolution, as part of this evolution process, one thing that we should all be very mindful of is that the resources that are there at our command, they are not, they are actually finite. And when you have finite resources, you know, already we are gobbling up resources which require two planet Earths. And days not far when we'll require three planet Earths in India to, uh, you know, have a good sustainable life. So it's not arbitrary. If trying to impose a technology on a city uh, just to improve the livability, I think the accent is primarily on sustainability. How do you sustain the, the living that we have on planet Earth by making use of technology? So it's the technology here is a human enabler rather than you know uh, uh, an enabler for the civilization if I may use that word. So to take this whole conversation forward, let me now request Mr. Sunil Dubey and uh, I will again request him to, he's from the University of Sydney and I'll request him to give his perspective on governance, data and local government and again request him to confine to 10 minutes uh, so that you know we can have a meaningful conversation. Thanks, Sanjay, and thanks, Amit, for setting up an excellent background for our discussions. Just at the outset, just at the outset, I come from Australia, and I want to acknowledge the original honors of that land and pay my respect before this session. I want to also link something which Sanjay mentioned. Can we have 21st century cities in 18th century infrastructure? And further looking at it, what Amit described, we are living in the most interesting time, but equally most challenging time. Let me take you to 800 to 900 AD during the dynasty of King Chanda. And I want to see parallels what we call the goddess of joy and happiness and the smart cities of today, which is very relevant for Rajasthan. This picture probably sounds, it seems a bit familiar to all of us, or at least in the state. And I want to draw a relationship with the cities. Cities as we see today, they are about people. We see the complexities of the cities through people, power and persuasion. This is where everything is happening. Over 65% of the human population is going to live in less than 4% of the entire area of the planet. So they are going to get crowded, but there's also going to be the center for the power. What I also want to say in connection with the power and being as a teacher, that I'm delighted to see a lot of younger people in this room. And I want to acknowledge your presence to say, these are the futures you're going to face, and you need to have these tools either through your own wisdom or knowledge or the skill set which you're going to develop. And cities are the centers where all these drama would take place. Cities are also about economy. This is where majority of the GDP, the global growth is generated. It's about enterprising. This is an image from Bangkok, where you can very clearly see how people are using the river system for a great economic and enterprising, and also about environment. We only have one planet, and before we go to Mars or Moon or anywhere else, 
we better look after this planet because it is about finite and it is about very critical resources which we have at hand. But something very important about the cities, that they are all bursting at the seams. Majority of the cities around the world, and this data represent something about the population growth. And it's very clear, this population growth and cities business is becoming very active and aggressive in Asia. Our next destination is Africa, but here, some of the real learnings are happening. Asian cities are defining the new urbanization. And in that, I want to take three compelling examples, two from Asia and one from South America, to demonstrate how learning and transformation, whether it's a data-driven transformation or it's a transformation from digital, is going to impact on the local governments. Number one, so, in the last five decades, no city in the world has managed to demonstrate the success of the city as Seoul has done. A city which transformed itself after the Korean War from almost negligible resources at the focal point of how data and technology can be used for improving the lives of people. Now, if some of you want to go out and speak, that's perfectly fine, but please don't speak in the room. Please, thank you. So Seoul is a data-driven city. It's also a very clear example of how transparency and open governance can work. And also, my favorite is, Seoul represent from physical highway to people's way. It's one city, and this clip, this image is an example of it. We see a lot of people moving in this image was once an expressway or a highway in Seoul. It was developed to cater for the needs of the transport and people of Seoul, and I want to acknowledge your presence, sir, from the Seoul Municipal Government here. People decided to get rid of the physicality or the obstruction within the city and transform the entire axis of the city to make it people's way. The point here is physical infrastructure is always going to provide you a limitation the day you develop an asset on your books in any financial system is a liability. So think very carefully before developing a lot of physical infrastructure. But Seoul remains one of the leading cities to see how data makes a difference in people's lives. Our second city is a city which some of you might know or might not have heard about it. But this has been, Medellin has been a poster boy for cities in almost last one decade. There's no price in the world which is dedicated to city and Medellin hasn't won. Why? 20 years ago, Medellin was the drug capital of the world. The drugs, the violence in the city of Medellin was the core branding of the city. In last decade or so, the leadership, people, and a real shift in planning change Medellin that today, from New York Times to every magazine, wants to give an example of Medellin. What has changed in Medellin is very simple. People looked at crime, people looked at people's social problems, and prepared to put their entire energy into making sure the planning put people first rather than technical solutions. The local government, or the mayor of the Medellin, or at least two mayors of the Medellin, they led this transformation. So today, Medellin sets an excellent example throughout the world to see how cities can be transformed for connectivity, for people's participation, and also looking at how the shift can really take place in our cities 
through including people into participation of planning. The third city is a city very close to India, which is a city which has set up new ways of transport, new ways of point-to-point -point travel, but also leading in every experiment in urban innovation in the world. City of Guangzhou is a city which Indian cities can relate to. The complexities, the numbers, and the systems, because they follow very strictly the centralized planning process, sets itself apart. And they have a mandate to be the global leader in urban innovation by 2020. And today in Guangzhou, what we see, they are leading in transport, they are leading in innovation, and the third and the most important thing for them is they are capturing a lot of data to ensure city management is not driven by humans a lot, but is almost like a machine-made management. There are a lot of complexities and challenge, but these three cities clearly shows to us if you look at the transformation by way of data, digitization, or people, they have a huge impact which can be measured in transforming governments. What does it all mean? What it means is three major things. Growth, sustainability, and environment, if they are not focused on people, they are not going to deliver any results for the cities. And the key lessons out of these three factors are simple. Digital or digitization or technology or innovation has to be local. This is a fundamental in terms of 100 smart cities or any smart cities in the world that unless we are prepared to localize data, the research is quite evident. The results are going to be a little bit of a vague to measure the real impact on people. Number two, people's participation. And this is the research we have been doing at the University of Sydney with some other institutions. It's very clearly demonstrating that it still remains far from reality in number of cities, especially in India and elsewhere in Asia. That is not necessarily a bad thing. In fact, it gives you an opportunity to make the difference and include people as shown in Medellin's example that people can transform their own cities. The third and the most important, and as an academic, I take the liberty to constructively criticize the word data, that please understand data is not the decision. Data is not the excuse. Data is not just an evident base in itself. All the data is providing it to us is a process, is an enabler to make things efficient for implementations. You still have to write your own narrative in cities. You still have to have a decision-making process as shown in Seoul, as shown in Guangzhou, that leadership is all about taking a lot of, a quantum of data to make a narrative about your city or the decision. And in my paper in 2016 and 17, I spoke about something about intelligent cities or intelligent systems. And my proposition is simple in this. War denotes failure of intelligence. And I'm not referring it to the war in terms of the two countries or the two regions fighting. I'm referring it to the war. We often talk about war and poverty. We often talk about war and pollution. We often talk about war and environment. Every time we speak about war, we are challenging the intelligence. What the technology and the smart cities are providing to us is that intelligence. And we don't have to go for war. We don't have to go to the extreme conditions. I think the systems provide us a great opportunity today, and they give us a tool their cities and people can participate in managing their city. Yeah. And going back and closing the presentation, I want to come back to this 800 to 900 AD, and this is very clear.
the complexities in the system, people environment is very critical and I think this is the key message for smart cities in India that let's look back in history and we will find a lot of solutions there. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you Mr. Dubey. Uh, in fact, town, trade and technology, if one may use that, are the three T's which actually allowed us to remain where we are uh, at this uh, part of our human civilization growth. And uh, uh, what is interesting is, and very important is, the diversity of all the cities. I mean, every city has its own culture. Every city has grown organically over a period of time and it presents to you a completely different milieu of how life is there in that particular city. And when it comes to diversity, it's also important that there are a lot of people who are from the technology background here, that they should also respect that diversity. It's not as if some one size fits all solutions will apply to all the cities, because most of the cities are at different levels of maturity. Even in, in our own country, we have towns which has, uh, which are right now facing problems of uh, even providing some basic infrastructure. So how do we create technology solutions which can you know, fit into the, uh, and get customized into the requirement of that particular city from the perspective of efficiency of operations is going to be a, a very important driver for technologies to come to the cities. So coming to the international experience, we already presented that uh, South Korea has uh, shown a remarkable turnaround in their performance in the Asian Games which were held recently to the transformation of their cities, transformation of their trade technology. And uh, I'll request Dr. Jung Woo Lee, who is the Managing Director of Seoul Digital Foundation, to give us a perspective on uh, how this digital transformation would happen in Seoul and can we derive some lessons from it. Again, please restrict yourself to the time within that frame that for answers. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, I'm Chung Woo Lee uh, and I'm Managing Director at Seoul Digital Foundation. Uh, this is first time in India and I'm very, very glad to be here with you. Actually, I'm, I'm, not, I, I'm not good at English, so I'm very nervous right now, but uh, I, uh, let me do my best for you guys. Uh, I, I think I can replace my presentation uh, with uh, Sonia's presentation, thanks to his good introduction of Seoul case. Uh, let me uh, introduce about the Seoul uh, digital transformation in Seoul with the smart city initiatives and strategies along with several uh, smart city cases. How many things about Seoul do you know? Yeah, Seoul is a capital city of the Republic of Korea uh, with a population of over uh, 10 million people. Seoul accounts for 22% uh, of Korea's GDP, uh, approximately uh, $1.5 trillion. It has many ICT resources and uh, more than 90% of Seoul citizens are uh, smartphone users. Uh, these, are, uh, these are the reasons uh, why Seoul uh, metropolitan government puts more effort uh, into smart city than any other city in the world. Urban challenges cannot be removed uh, completely with digital technology. Uh, however, technology help uh, find the solutions uh, to uh, challenges uh, and urban uh, problems. Uh, the city of Seoul announced uh, digital plan 2020 and suggested slogan, new C, new connectivity, new E, new experience. Four categories that Seoul will focus. They are social city, dynamics, digital social, social innovation, and global digital leadership. Source of leading smart policy, smart policies are based on uh, one of the world's highest speed broadband network uh, established through, uh, throughout Seoul. The city of Seoul, city of Seoul has been operating a high speed network. Uh, one of them is ESOLnet uh, for administrative work and USOLnet for the civic services. 
CCTV integrated surveillance system is controlling over uh, 40,000 CCTVs. Uh, TVs. The city of Seoul uh, is setting up free Wi-Fi zone to reduce the uh, citizens' communication expenses and create an environment of uh, participating in various uh, smart city services. Uh, uh, 10,559 uh, access points are installed in major public places, uh, such as tourist attractions and parks, libraries, etc. Uh, and Wi-Fi has been installed in subway, uh, subway lines, uh, so we can enjoy the uh, internet uh, in the subway right now. So is a frontier in offering innovative public services. Uh, fortunately, we have very strong ICT. Uh, let me introduce uh, with uh, open data, uh, bottom-up communication, and data-driven public services. Let me introduce some of uh, representative public uh, services in a little more detail. Democracy So. Democracy So website is operated uh, so that citizens uh, can always propose policy. Uh, the, uh, it has uh, it had launched uh, in October 27. Any suggestion that gets more than five votes should be reviewed uh, by related departments of the city of Seoul. After being uh, reviewed, implementable suggestions are put for public voting. After voting, citizen becomes the final decision maker whether to implement uh, suggestions or not. The city of Seoul is uh, operating a Seoul Open Data Plaza. It has a 4,700 uh, data set in 10 areas with average uh, 670,000 daily views. The city of Seoul is actively working on building the whole of Seoul as an IoT living lab by 2020. Seoul metropolitan government, private companies, uh, and citizens are making life friendly IoT services uh, together and verifying and spreading them in real life. Uh, in, order to, in order to do that, uh, the city of Seoul provides administrative infrastructure such as uh, wired wireless communication network, public data opening, and administrative support. So IoT Center also provides professional enterprise supporting programs uh, such as prototyping uh, of IoT companies and communication and market entry. The best innovative example is the night bus, night old bus, uh, that solves traffic problems and improves the citizens' convenience, inconvenience in the middle of the night. The collected data, three billion calls, was from 11, uh, 12 o'clock a.m. to 5 a.m. in cooperation with private telecommunication company, uh, Korea Telecom. It then matches the caller's location and billing location uh, to determine where people want to go in the middle of the night. Based on the date, it constructed a uh, best nine routes to cover an average of uh, 7,400 passengers per day with 47 uh, buses. It was named that, named, that, uh, named uh, best policy of the city by the citizens in 2013. So it has built a topic system that collects every single traffic information from all related organizations. Topis integrates uh, uh, such as uh, taxi, CCTVs, digestion information, and bus information uh, throughout the city. Okay. At present, currently, Topis focus the arrival times of the city buses and the number of the seats left on the bus and provides them to citizens. Also, the city of Seoul opened the data uh, for use by online businesses, startups, and others. Uh, let me introduce Seoul uh, so Digital Foundations uh, now. Technology is changing so fast, and it's very challenging to apply new technology to the city. Uh, the city of Seoul established uh, Seoul Digital Foundation in uh, 2016. So uh, Digital Foundation is a digital expert group serving as a digital think tank uh, for the city. We are currently 100% funded by the city. 
core activities are policy research, public service innovation uh, with the citizens, education for digital literacy, operating uh, citizen lab. Uh, it's a kind of uh, digital living lab. We try to work as a platform, uh, connect demand, connecting demand and supply, and boost activities in the progress process. We conduct policy research to promote digital economy and digital urban innovation. Uh, basically, we are a research platform uh, uh, finding out policy demand and connect research and implementation. Uh, we built a solid network uh, with experts from industry, academia, domestic, and global. City, uh, the city of Seoul is operating huge public services uh, as I said, uh, they, are tra uh, they are transportation, environment, construction, water supplies. Uh, they need digital transformation, uh, but they don't have idea why and how to do that. Uh, we also support uh, them so they uh, easily trans uh, transform their services in the form of idea, suggestion, consulting, partnership making with uh, educating AI, big data for high profile IT professionals. Also, we are operating uh, Urban Data Science Lab, which is a joint effort between Seoul National University and Seoul Digital Foundation to seek solutions for Seoul's. Uh, we are trying to build Korean style living lab. Yeah, Korea is culturally uh, different from Western countries. So we cannot play, apply, no play, apply, EU model uh, to us. We combine the bottom up and top down approach to promote the citizens' activities. We reserved space called the Citizen Lab and support communities committed to urban innovation to lead them uh, social impact in Seoul, Korea with cutting edge technology. We believe that giving digital literacy to citizens is very important to role of the city of Seoul. So we completed the curriculum for digital literacy and continue to improve it every year. We are, uh, we are teaching skills, problem solving skills, and digital citizenship. Not the educational institute. We make pilot programs and scale up at our public education systems. Uh, I don't know uh, if I can answer your uh, on the spot questions very well, uh, but uh, if you have any questions, please contact me by uh, email and I will be able to give you uh, the answer as detailed as, I, uh, as possible. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. In fact, Dr. Lee, you were the one who saved a minute for me. <laughs> so I think that, that's, that, that's the essence of how we need to manage our time. Friends, this technology uh, is now everywhere. In fact, it has transformed our lives to an extent we never imagined it. I'm still reminded of my days as municipal commissioner when even for paying municipal taxes, we didn't even have an online system and people had to queue up before banks for doing a job which actually we mandated as a state for them to do, which is not bringing them any service. And you know, while we when we look at technological solutions and the kind of things that are coming in, it's almost everywhere. Every sphere of our life, every sphere of our urban life is impactable now with the help of technology. And what we see in terms of the use of technology is only a tip of an iceberg. But it's also important that, that when we create such products, because a lot of technology uh, technologists around here, uh, we don't create these products from the supply side, they should be from the demand side. Not what you intend to give to them, what is it that the citizens of that particular town require. It's also important that we not just focus our attention on products, we also focus our full attention on the processes, how we involve them in the development of those products. So we have uh, uh, Mr. Anison Murthy who comes from PwC and uh, uh, he's going to be presenting his ideas on Smart City 2.0 and uh, I would again request him to confine himself into the time limits that we have. Mr. Murthy. Thank you. I'll, I'll definitely try to.
Uh, so, so before I start the presentation, and I just the presentation is divided into three stories. And before a story starts, I want to talk about another story, but there's a small question in that. So let's take an example, and this is my favorite example. I think people who are in PwC would be fed up of this example from my side. Uh, I know my colleague is laughing on me. Uh, so just take an example of a news newspaper article which says that a woman was harassed at night. Who's the one body which will be blamed for this? Police, right? But if you actually go into details of that, why the woman was harassed at night? Because she was walking on the road which had no street lights working. She was not walking on the road, but she was on the sidewalks because the road was under repair. She was actually unable to, it's why she was actually walking? Because the bus didn't come. The bus transportation was not working. And why the SOS didn't work? Because the SOS button needs to have a telecom operator behind it. Finally, if you actually put together all these components and think about it, the PWD, the Municipal Corporation, Bus Transport Services, Telecom Operator, there's no police. Who's supposed to blame? So I'm not talking about who's going to improve the information uh, or the structure of the entire cities. I'm only talking about, I think when we look at a problem, we are, we are actually blinded by the magnitude of that and the, and the kind of definition of that. It's primarily a symptom to some other problem. And that's what the whole discussion is all about in my presentation. Uh, this is not what India is right now doing, but India is aspiring to do it. While we as PwC, we work with almost more than 40 odd cities across India on the Smart Cities mission or almost like 80 to 90 cities in India. This, this is something which we have tried to actually gather from various sources and try to put together a stuff. So we are looking at India as what is that the infrastructure and the technology investments will help India taking forward. That's the 2.4 part of it. You're going to learn, unlearn a lot of stuff. There's a lot of things that India needs to learn, but it also needs to unlearn a lot of stuff. So one of the unlearning part of it is, I should not stand up when somebody is speaking. Okay, I should not walk out of the doors. So that's the basic courtesy. So I would like everyone to extend that to all the delegates who have come from outside of Jaipur and outside of India. That's point number one. The other things that it's, it's there, it's a marketplace. Smart cities is not a subject, not a sector. You don't get taught as a sector or a subject. It's a marketplace. It's a marketplace of data. You like it or you don't like it, it's actually the data everybody is working on this. It's a smart uh, marketplace of data. Sm smart cities is something where you don't have friends, you don't have enemies. You only have collaborators and aggregators. You cannot work alone you cannot work in a small ecosystem. It needs to be larger because the problems are much, much larger in the cities. I don't want to talk about the, the third one. The fourth one, I really loved the uh, presentations by Amit and everyone, but I really think that the technology and the smart cities are going to drive a different set of business models. That's what we are going to talk about. So before this, let me actually say that I'm going to touch upon three things, which is businesses, citizens, and uh, city governance. And they also touch upon the governance of the city. They also talk about quality of life, and it will also talk about economic vibrancy in the city. So how do we do all these things together? By using data. We heard a lot of times, I think uh, everyone is talking about integrated command and control centers, control rooms, command centers. And I am trying to visualize at least one commissioner or one smart city CEO who plans to sit 24 bar 7 in that command and control center and run it. Un unfortunately, I'm unable to imagine any single city commissioner and a city CEO sitting in a command center and working on it. It's the responsibilities of the operations head. Even the Rio, when it built the entire command and control center, it was the chief operating officer who was actually part. So what we are saying is where the governance will come from the command center. The data will actually drive the governance of it. The commissioner would like to see what is the operational efficiency. He's, he's only looking at the incident. He's not looking at how many uh, traffic incidents which are going on. 
which is the one traffic incident out of the 20 which is happening, I need to be there on site trying to look at that. So that's his mode. Similarly, fiscal discipline, development and compliance. These are the ones he will broadly look at. And do I need a command center for this or can I get this thing on my mobile? So when are we actually moving to the second phase of ICCC and saying that it's a 2.0 or next version or M ICCC, whatever you want to version it, but mobile is going to be the one single place where the executive of the city will use it to drive all the innovations and decisions. That's the governance part of it. The second is, it's, it's a small use case and this my team has actually put together based on some kind of uh, information coming from everyone. So if we just a, a maid boom, she is a domestic health working in a city Gurgaon and she has got going through all these problems of children, harassment at workplace, not getting uh, enough of uh, funding for actually increasing her business and stuff like that. So what do we actually can data do about it? Data can help reach us, uh, give her information about and insights along with various other people who are startups, who are industry departments, who are city municipal corporations. They, when they actually look at, talk to her, get that data, if you actually put together into one single seamless open data format, the people will be able to use and give the services back. I'm not going to go through the use cases and read it. This will all be online afterwards. But I'm just only saying that even a maid servant will get impacted if we implement the open data systems in a city for all departments properly. That's the power of how we can do an integrated city planning. My last slide. I think I'm going to the first speaker will do less than uh, the time six or three minutes is the entrepreneurship and startups. We need to have the systems of the city, which is the data of the city thrown open to the entrepreneurs and the startups to fuel this new gen where India is going to make a difference is where the, the startups and the entrepreneurs are going to use this data use cities as a live laboratories to run these use cases and take it to the fields make sure we don't know that how will it be used in India but will it be used outside of India but where it's going to be tested which are the business problems I have met so many startups in the last you know, six months a couple of them working on such a beautiful stuff where they can actually identify based on IoT devices what is the roads number of potholes on a road how many mosquitoes and what type of gender and the species of the mosquito so that I can do fumigation properly. So those are the stuff which is going to drive, ignite the entire business model and the entrepreneurship economic development in the cities. That's all from my side. I think that's, that's where the cities are going to move forward and create, uh, smart cities are going to create a lot of impact on the society. Thank you so much. That's very good, Mr. Murthy. You finished it uh, three minutes in advance and uh, you talked about data. In fact, data, they say, is the new oil. Data is the new currency. In fact, uh, I read it somewhere that the, the kind of data human mind is exposed to on a daily basis now is actually 10 times more than the data which our ancestors had, say, 400 years back, all their life. Now, whether this data is making us smart or stupid is an open question. But uh, that's how the reality is. And uh, you know, when it comes to data and the use of technology, it's also important that uh, when we provide solutions, A, the solutions are affordable. And I think that's, that's the challenge for the technology players. And the second and the most, most important thing is, I don't know how you're going to take care of the obsolescence of the technology. Because if you're going to give us solutions which are going to last say for five years and then make us do it all over again, I don't think that's going to serve the uh, economies like ours. I think these are some of the challenges and the questions that possibly we need to look at and maybe this conference and this panel would like to explore some of these uh, points that I was trying to highlight. I'd now like to bring in the last panelist, Mr. Natarajan, belongs to Tech Mahindra and uh, uh, he is going to talk to you about uh, some of the use cases uh, in smart waste management, emergency response systems, 
and they need governance. Uh, of course, uh, again, with my experience, I can tell you that technology has a huge potential to transform uh, city lives. And we can only hope that this potential is uh, exploited in a positive manner and uh, not imposed on cities in, a, in an inorganic fashion. Mr. Karthikeyan. All right, thanks, uh, Sanjay. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm really uh, happy to be here and share some of the insights of how did we uh, help in some of the governments to be transformed, leveraging the digital technologies. And before I start up my presentation, I represent Mahindra Group, which believes in the core purpose in one word called RICE, which is defined by accepting no limits, alternate thinking, and driving positive change in everything that we do around our communities. So this fits into the purpose that the group uh, has uh, started working for the last 70 years. And I'm happy to share uh, three or four stories. When we really started working on uh, transforming the governments, the first instance was when we started working with Singapore way back in 10 years. And uh, the biggest change management the Singapore government has to do was to bring in uh, uh, close to 57 departments to agree on one common database. And this is something the change management took more than 18 months to get all of them to be on the same page and realize that what one database can do for them. So if you want to really look at onemap.sg, you will find that there are about 170 citizen services are offered online in one site. And this is something is the first venture that we started working on digitizing the governments and enabling the citizens with services enabled through various government sources. So quick background on Tech Mahindra, which is close to $5 billion company. And uh, we are also recognized amongst the top 15 companies uh, enabling the digital transformation worldwide by Forbes. And uh, we are also one of the large system integrator. And we have done more than half a dozen cities in India and enabling them to be smart. And we also believe that when you talk about smart cities, it is about three pillars. One, it has to be citizen centric. And two, it has to help for the municipal governments or the urban city planning to be enabled. And I've come across some of the global cities that we are working on where uh, the traffic data is used to decide how to really set up the parking lots because they realized that what is the kind of traffic that goes in and out and where do they see the stagnation and where do people stop more often and how do you think the data could really start helping them to decide where to construct new parking lots. So I think data is going to be very important. Data has a very important role to play as many of the other speakers talked about. And also the third important thing is about engaging the citizens in the process and making them to be part of the change. And whether it is about creating sustainable cities or creating safe cities, I think which is very, very important process. And we'll share some of the examples of what programs that we implemented and how did the citizen adopt to really start using them. So we also represent multiple entities as part of Mahindra Group and the Life Spaces, which works on creating urban uh, lives, urban workspaces. They build the uh, world cities and they've done about three of them. They're building three more. And Tech Mahindra, which is a technology and digital services company and which focuses on implementing uh, technologies for smart cities. And we also have Mahindra Defense and Electric. As a group, I think what I really want to uh, bring out, we are committed to sustainability. So you will start seeing that whether it is in terms of electrification of cars or whether it is about uh, urban living. And we definitely bring in the sustainability as a core theme across all the tenants of the group. And when you really start looking at smart cities in general, you will start seeing that there is a physical infrastructure part, which I talked about how we have already enabled uh, three uh, world cities in India and we're building three more. And when you also talk about on the institutional infrastructure, whether it is about smart governance, smart surveillance and command center, and we already set up about three of this for three cities in India. And also trying to integrate with the economic infrastructure, whether it is smart warehouse and logistics, and also with the social infrastructure. 
the key points I want to really talk about how is the technology is enabling them whether it is about IOT whether it is about mobility and artificial intelligence and blockchain and the latest announcement that we made is to work closely with the Telangana government in trying to really digitize the land records which is one of the most difficult tasks which may take another one decade for this to get complete but how to use blockchain technologies to really digitizing the land records. So these are some of the examples how the technologies are being brought in for a smart governance or e-governance. And taking this story forward, I just want to talk about few of these examples and how each of them have really transformed the communities that we live in. And UP Dial and Red, which is implemented about 18 months ago, I'll have a video to play, I'll just keep it brief. And this is something which covers about 220 million population of state of Uttar Pradesh and one number that helps citizens to get help and from police. And uh, if it is within uh, urban locations within 15 minutes and the rural locations within 20 minutes, the help is being provided. The interesting statistics as far as the UP dial and is concerned that it covers more than 700,000 cities and about 100,000 villages and about 1,500 police stations and more than 2 million geotagged locations. So which means people can recognize so the accuracy of plus minus 10 meters by the time somebody calls the call center. And we have saved more than 1,000 lives as part of what we have done in uh, UP Dial and Red. The second one I want to touch upon is about the Municipal Corporation of Delhi. So we have implemented the e-governance program and integrating 80 plus departments and also 100% of the services are delivered through the e-governance portal. This has been implemented six years ago and currently this is being used by all the citizens to the extent of 2.5 million transactions per year and more than 30% increase in terms of the revenue that we are able to announce for the local government. And this is another massive program with 25 million population which is one of the largest program in the world that we implemented. The third one that I want to highlight is about the Jabalpur Smart uh, City where we have implemented the waste management. The interesting concept is this covers about 270,000 households. It doesn't stop at the bins, it goes to the household level. And this is again probably one of the largest waste management implementation in the world. Interesting statistics is not just about collection of waste, but it is being transformed into electricity and to the extent of about 12 megawatt energy is already generated from the waste. And also it, it reduced the carbon emissions by 37,000 tons and daily unsegregated waste that is processed is close to about 600 tons and the land saved from solid waste is close to 4.4 hectares. And this is something that we definitely believe is one of the transforming projects that we implemented. And this could be something which can be scaled up in many other cities. And with that out of, I'll probably just play a quick video which talks about what we have done on UP Dial with customers who are experiencing the services that are being provided by us. We also taken uh, some of our initiatives uh, worldwide and beyond India to uh, Middle East and South Asia as well as with the Latin American countries. Can I have the video please? Now, 
all these components of the various applications that we have, they all have to fit together and work in a seamless manner. It's a very, very complex technology implementation that we are actually very proud of. We wanted the public interface to be managed by somebody who is not a police officer. As a basic concept of design, we thought that we will have an all-woman call center working round the clock which will take public calls. When we partnered with Tech Mahindra, we are actually extremely happy with the way these people are handling our calls. In the society, the people who are very difficult, we understand the problems of their problems, we work with them, we help them, we serve them, and this is the thing that we have to work with every day with every day. See, women are more empathetic to the person who is in distress. If somebody is trying to commit suicide, if a lady talks to him or her, there is a higher chance of that person listening to her. They are saving so many lives every day. This is possible because of women here. तू जो यूपी सॉम में काम करके बहुत अच्छा फील होता है क्योंकि यहाँ पे जो भी कॉल्स हमारे पास आ रहे हैं जरूरतमंद लोगों की हम उनकी पूरी सहायता कर पाते हैं। And eighty percent citizens are saying yes, we are very happy the way police help. We are becoming the voice and the face of the UP police. We understand it's a huge responsibility. And I'm proud to say that the kind of services we are offering to citizens in the distress, we're changing the game completely. This is a great feeling. It's, it's self-satisfying. We are all driven by this feeling that if I can be of use to somebody, probably my life is good. The way this project has been completed in record time shows the commitment and dedication not only of Mahindra Defense Team, but also of the UP government, its various departments and UP police, which together made it possible. I would like to wish the citizens of UP, the government of UP and UP police all the best in the times ahead. Thank you. We continue to rise. We continue to make positive impact around the communities that we live in. Thank you. Thank, thank you. You know, I, have, uh, I, can, I can tell you from my personal experience, uh, uh, technology and positive change is always embraced by citizens and, you know, you'll always get dividends from in terms of uh, uh, both political as well as uh, praise from people if you do good things. A small example of solid waste management, I'm talking about the year 2000, 2001. You know, we had these garbage trucks which were collecting solid, solid, solid waste from, from localities and uh, every month you will get a standard bill from these contractors. Uh, while citizens would complain that their solid waste is not getting lifted. So, you know, a very small solution, of, a small technology solution was implemented by us way back in Mysore at that time. We just put some way bridge at the landfill points. The moment the truck used to enter, there was a way bridge which used to measure the total tons that this particular truck was bringing in. And that measurement was recorded by a small computer that we had at the station. And we used to post that on our websites. And so every day we used to have the information pertaining to each one of the wards that we had and how much of garbage was picked up from those localities. And a, a, a bit of a use of a technology to provide transparency of information actually, you know, not just created transparency in terms of how the bills were raised, but it also helped us actually keep the city clean and, you know, provide satisfaction to people. Technology has now advanced. You have uh, uh, communication systems have, have improved. And I think uh, uh, it's no exaggeration to say that uh, we are looking at at a world which is going to get completely transformed by technology and technological developments. So, so friends, we had this uh, uh, conference of five speakers who actually gave you insights into how technology can improve the smart cities. There were international experiences, the national experience. I, uh, I don't know whether we have time, but maybe a couple of questions. Uh, no, we don't have time. I think we've, we've all overshot our times. So we don't have time. and. And the only takeaway from my perspective is, and I hope that 
that's true for all, all of you as well, is that <coughs> a smart city solution would have to A, bring in sustainability, which was brought out in one of the presentations. Very important that what we do allows us to take these cities beyond us. Second was with respect to efficiency, how it improves the efficiency of operations that we do in the cities. And the third and the most important one is whether it improves our livability. And I hope on this note we uh, uh, end this panel and I would like to thank all the members of the panelists who gave uh, wonderful insights in, and all of you kept the time limit that we had. So once again, my appreciation to all the panelists and I'm sure all the presentations will be available online for you to have a uh, look into them if you were not able to get enough insights into what they wanted to bring into. Thank you very much.